Hey, uh, so I'm Josh Roby, and I'm going to do a weird thing, maybe. I'm going to do my out loud read edit pass for uh, the port of call that I'm writing for this month. And I'm going to do it on a video and see if that's even worth watching for other people. This is something that I do with uh, mostly everything that I write. Uh, when I get it to the almost finished, polished stage, I do an out loud reading, uh, which helps to have a nice, quiet, empty house. Uh, but I read it start to finish and uh, usually make slight changes for flow and stuff like that as I go. And I thought maybe I'd record it, so I don't even know if I'll even show this to anyone. But hey, we'll give it a try. So this is Samarkand at Crossroads. So there I am, creeping down the outer curtain wall of the Citadel, the damn camera sloshing back and forth on my back. I'm trying to follow the directions, but the old castle has been built and rebuilt across centuries, so nothing is straightforward. I slip through a door and up a tower, and finally I step out onto a balcony where I can get the perfect shot of the whole western wall. It's only when the flash powder goes off that I see the mercenaries sitting there, quietly drinking as they wait for me to realize that I've been captured. By way of consolation, they offer me a swig. Now, the first thing uh, we notice there is that I've got back, I'm sloshing back and forth on my back, so we should probably change that. So we'll change it from on my back to across my shoulders, and hopefully that will not create a flow problem. Yeah, okay, great. Bum -ba -da -bum -bum -bum. Welcome to Samarkand. You'll find in the following pages a description of the ancient city of Samarkand and its all too present woes. Long a, key trade ne Long a key trade nexus on the Silk Road, the city has traded hands and rulers many times. Most recently, Russia swept down from the north and seized Samarkand from the Emirate of Bukhara, only to have it reconquered days later. Now, with the Russian counterattack looming and the heir to Samarkand Balak missing, tensions are running as high as the city is old. This port of call includes six Game Master characters enmeshed in the machinations, history, and dreams of Samarkand, ready and willing to pull the Picaros into their drama. Samarkand at Crossroads is a delicate port of call, more vulnerable than most. Its tumultuous political situation is complicated by conflicting layers of identity and loyalty, with the fate of a city hanging in the balance. There we go, there's page one. Sounds good. The Fulcrum of the Silk Road. Here is what is interesting about Samarkand. No one knows how long the city has been here. There are no steles, there are no monuments, there are no cartouches commemorating the foundation of the city. We have found no records in neighboring cities of the rise of Samarkand. It is always treated as a constant, an inescapable fact of existence, a city over the horizon ready to trade. It is quite possible, then, that the city of Samarkand predates written language. Whether this must mean that it was founded by Noah's children or perhaps was the city to which Cain fled, I leave to the consideration of theologians. My interest is geographical. This city has connected the worlds of East and West for all of humanity's history. I have written the Silk Road before, and this city must be considered the jewel of that road, the fulcrum of its operation. Silk, silver, and spices flowed through here, not to mention religions, ideas, art, and technologies. Up until the Ottomans closed it down to spite the West in 1453, of course, much to its own loss. But now we have taken to the skies and can circumvent the Turks entirely, even if the Russians' trade tariffs and transit fees are positively bruising. Still, Trade along this corridor seems to have resumed using Samarkand as a coaling station. So here's a slight problem here. Uh, Richtofen here is talking about how he's circumventing the Turks entirely, uh, but he is in fact going right through, and Samarkand is in the middle of what is still Turkish territory. Not Ottoman Turks, but still Turks. Uh, so we need to fix that. Um... Duh, duh, duh. I'll just say the Turks of Aleppo. 
do 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 because Aleppo is the capital. What am I talking about? Aleppo is not the capital. <laughs> Turks of Constantinople. Excuse my history. All right, moving on. The city itself rests at the western foot of the Tian Shan Mountains. Mountains, that's a nice way to say that. The city itself rests at the western foot of the Tian Shan Mountains, which themselves eventually rise up to the roof of the world. The, the Zaravshan River tumbles down from these frozen peaks into the desert below. Samarkand sits between mountain and desert as it sits between east and west, ever the mediator between opposites and the fulcrum of great leverage. Even with the waters of the Zer Zer Zaravshan, yeah, you can tell I've written this and not spoken it. Even with the waters of the Zaravshan, though, Samarkand's environs are arid. Combined with its elevation of some 2,000 feet, the nights and winters grow bitingly cold and dry. Snow is not unknown here. As is often the case, the city of Samarkand used its position along the valuable trade route to amass great wealth, which can be seen everywhere in its impressive, if somewhat worn, architecture. The Registan, a sort of central square of the city, is faced with three towering madrasas, or colleges, each faced with an elaborate geometric mosaic in blues, reds, and gold. This square could challenge in majesty any city center found in Europe or the Far East. The rest of the city spreads in all directions, tall and sprawling sandstone edifices for a mile or more. So, something that happens often when I write things is sentences that are too freaking long. Uh, so, as is often the case, the city of Samarkand uses position along the valuable trade route to amass great wealth. Full stop! This can be seen everywhere in its impressive, if somewhat worn, architecture. Do, 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 do. I'm also not too happy with the valuable trade route, which seems kind of boring. As, uh, as is often the case, the city of Samarkand used its position along... Uh, that trade route, but I haven't really talked about it before. Uh, then we'll superlatize it. Uh, this most valuable trade route to amass great wealth. Boom, ba boom, boom, boom. Uh, so it now reads, As is often the case, the city of Samarkand used its position along this most pro... Oh, no. Now I've got, as often the case, and this most... Blah, 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 blah. Uh... Uh, so instead of as is often the case, we'll go like its sister cities. There we go. Like its sister cities along the Silk Road, the city of Samarkand used its position along the most valuable trade route to amass great wealth. This can be seen everywhere in its impressive, if somewhat worn, architecture. Better! Beyond these sandstone walls lie green fields. To the north, these fields bracket the waters of the Zaravshan. To the south, the ancient Dargom ca Canal. Excuse me. The ancient Dargom Canal carries the river's water across as many or more fields as one might find to the south. What? See, this is this is why we do the read. To the north, these fields bracket the waters of the Zaravshan. To the south, the ancient Dargom Canal carries the river's water across as many or more... F wow. Yeah. Between these two branches, the entire city is embraced by flowing water throughout the year. That's a good sentence. The one before, not so much. Let's fix it. To the north, these fields bracket the waters of the Zravshan. To the south, the ancient Dar Dargon Can Canal carries the river's water... Well, okay. We're just going to reduce that down to a lot of fields. Oh. Oh, to the north, these fields bracket the waters of the Zravsham. To the south, 
The ancient Dargon Canal carries the river's water across many more fields. Even more farmland. Boom, boom, boom. And since that has reduced paragraph by line, I'll need to adjust the text box. Like so. Not that you can see it. All right. So now we have, beyond these sandstone walls lie green fields. To the north, these fields bracket the waters of the Zaravshan. To the south, the ancient Dargob Canal carries the Waters River across even more farmland. Between these two branches, the entire city is embraced by flowing water throughout the year. The horizon of Samarkand is dominated by mountains on three sides. Only to the west does the sun set over the arid plain. In that direction lies the capital, Bukhara, and then miles upon miles of desert, the Caspian Sea, and finally Europe. But my travels shall take me east, up the roof of the world. From the Mountains of Transoxonia, Professor Ferdinand von Richtofen. Right, I seem to have uh, not capitalized C in Caspian Sea, which should be fixed, and then we'll move on. Bum, bum, bum. To my father, the emir, Muzaffar al-Din. I have thrown off the yoke of the Russian oppressors, father. I would say that I am sorry if this puts you in a difficult position, but I am not. Foreign invaders seized one of the emirate's brightest cities, and you did not even rise from your seat. You ordered me not to ride with my army to retake the city, but I cannot countenance such cowardly dictates, even from the emir of Bukhara, even from my own father. So I have liberated your city, father, and now you will have to act like an emir who cares for the well-being of his subjects. The Russians left a small force, some 500 men, in the citadel. The bulk of Kaufman's forces, along with his airships, moved west towards Katakurgan. Storm clouds cut off heliograph contact between the citadel and the airships, and this was when we attacked. It was a beautiful assault, my father. We would have made even Timur proud as we took the seat of his ancient empire. The Russians' few patrols in the cities were overwhelmed in the first hour. We rode through the seats with... No, sorry. We rode through the streets. That's not even a typo. That's just me not being able to read. We rode through the streets with bared steel and torches converging on the citadel. We seized the approaches and ringed the fortress with rifles. The Russians quailed behind the walls, knowing that any head they presented would be shot. The siege lasted only a single night. We breached the ancient wall the next day. The fighting was fierce, but the end was always clear. We routed the Russians and those cowering with them, turncoats and traitors to your rule. It was then that we discovered the beg of Samarkand and his family, dead in his palace, left in the corners where they were shot. With such brutality on display, our forces seized upon the invaders and their lackeys and made them suffer the same fate that they had forced on a good man, his wives, and his children. The beg... <laughs> Here's where the pronunciation gets real hot tough, because I have no idea how to pronounce this. The begs of Sharizabaz... No? Sharizabz. I don't know. It's Persian. The begs of Shariz... <laughs> The begs of Sharizbad and Kitab were most affected by the display, for obvious reasons. They had fought like lions that day, hoping to liberate their fellow beg, but I think they already knew that the laxity of your rule had already cost them their kin. Also at our sides, I should note, were a sizable number of... Cr and here we are again. This is not... This isn't Persian. This is... Uh, Tajik, I think. <laughs> Also at our sides, I should note, were a sizable number of Karakalpaks and Kipchaks brought by Ishan Omar Khan, Matum al-Azami. I know you know, I know you lose no love for him and the rest of the... <laughs> oh, this is when the research goes against, collides with my ability to say it. I know you know, I know you lose no love for him and the rest of the... Makdamzadas, which are, you know, a real dynasty. 
but such alliances were necessary to win the city. I send this missive in a trusted hand, Father, because as disappointed as I am in your recent lack of action, I still owe you a son's love. And I tell you this in love. You must rise to your royal duties, or they will be taken from you. If I must, I will take them from you before they are taken by someone else. Abdul Malik Tura, your, lore, your loyal Hakem of Gusar. Uh, now, aside the, from the things that I can't actually pronounce, I, I'm I'm happy with this section. Uh, my only problem is that uh, unknown to the Torah here, uh, his father is fighting the Russians. Uh, he is, in fact, the forces that the Russians went off to go fight at Katakurgan. Uh He doesn't know that, that so that can't appear in this uh, letter. Uh, but I feel. I feel like I've maligned this poor emir uh, because I don't have it anywhere else in the border call that he's, he's out there fighting the Russians. Uh, so maybe I'll find some other place to uh, drop that somewhere in this port of call. Do, do, do. Okay. Uh, Zuri, my wife, um, not my wife, Zuri, my life and soul. I am writing this quickly to let you know that I am safe and unharmed. I did not know I would be traveling into a battlefield. Or rather, I knew I would be traveling into a war, but I assumed it would be a simple affair and over quickly. I hoped to ride the wake of the fighting and arrive after the dying was over. Instead, I arrived just in time for the counter-effect. The counter-effect, that's not even a word. Instead, I arrived just in time for the counterattack that returned the city to Bukharan hands. The details of that are trivial, but I knew you would want to hear from me regardless. A few thoughts on the Turks here before I take this letter to the airship courier. I know you are just as interested as I on the nature of this far edge of the Turkic world. I was led to understand that Bukhara was ruled by Persian emirs and its sister states Kiva and Kokan by Mongol-descended Khans, all of them peopled primarily by Turks, but this reality seems slightly more complicated. But the reality seems slightly more complicated. That should be farmed off to its own sentence. Do, 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 do. Uh, again, with my ridiculously long sentences. Okay. I was led to understand that Bukhara was ruled by Persian emirs and its sister states Kiva and Kukan by Mongol-descended Turks. No, I can't even read. Uh, sister states Kiva and Kukan by Mongol-descended Khans, all of them peopled primarily by Turks. The reality seems slightly more complicated. The peoples here, Kazakhs to the west, Tajiks to the east, and Uzbeks in the middle, have seen invasions from the Mongols to the north and the Persians to the south over the course of centuries. With each wash of conquerors, the people pick up foreign customs and dress and have been doing so for so long that it is difficult to say what any of them were originally. Kazakhs are definitely Turks. Uzbeks are probably Turks. Tajiks, perhaps they are Turks? Their speech is foreign, but perhaps they lost their original Turkic tongue in some ancient conquest. All of which is to say, my task of convincing the people here that they have more in common with the Turks of their distant west than with their Mongol and Persian overlords will be difficult. I have no doubt that this entire region will eventually fall to Russia. Without petty tyrants forcing them into outdated molds, they will shed their backwards ways like snakeskin. Then our real work will begin, uplifting our fellow Turks, educating them in the modern ways pioneered by Europe, and bringing our people out of savagery. After I conclude this letter, I will turn to writing for the paper. Again, with the Russian words and grammars, so stiff, unyielding, and awkward, as always, I dream of writing in Turkish. One day, my love, we will publish a newspaper in the language of our people, uniting Turks in the heady world of knowledge no matter if they live in the Ottomans, the Russians, or petty khans and emirs dreaming of feudal glory. But in the meantime, I write for the Russian paper. I will see you at the. I will send you a copy of the manuscript, my love. Your little lamb.
is male. The only problem in there is that I seem to have not capitalized Turks consistently. Do, 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 do. Which is sort of a weird edge case. I'm not actually sure if that should be capitalized or not. Because um, it's an ethnic group, in this case, not a nationality. Uh, nationalities are capitalized because they are derived from nations, which are proper names. Um, but I don't know about that. I'm going to have to look that up outside of this because I don't want you to sit there and watch me look at things on Wikipedia. So yeah, I'll write a note about that. To my cousin, Jura Beg, my soldiers collected the bodies of the noble family for bathing and shrouding. The burials will occur at dawn. However, there was a discrepancy. By my memory, the Beg of Samarkand possessed six sons and five daughters. We only, five, we only found five sons and five daughters. Perhaps we will find the body of this missing son elsewhere in the palace. If we do not, then the boy, the youngest, he should be nearly twenty, is the proper beg of Samarkand. I do not wish to inflate your hopes, but you may have one surviving nephew. Baba Beg. That's nice and short, and uh, doesn't have a grum. Heliograph number 3827, decoded via cipher A. To Sir Ronald Ferguson Thompson, envoy extraordinary to Persia. The Tura continues to rebuild the city, shoring up the citadel he himself just breached, paying off the mercenaries who helped him, and strutting about as if he were a fabulous hero. I do not know why you had me help him. I regret it already. But I do as you command, my lord. Your vision exceeds mine, even if your vantage point is distant Tehran, and I float directly above the little conates that you have taken such an excessive interest in. I have picked up a new crewmate, who might be of interest to you, young and pretty, found on the streets of Samarkand shortly after the Russian invasion, and with a secret. At first I thought the child was a bacha, a dancing boy, escaped from a cruel man's master. I think you have something similar in England? Boys who are admired for their feminine qualities and used by older men to sate their sexual appetites? I think someone referred to Eaton as a clearinghouse for such business. Perhaps I misremember the details. But I have strayed from my point. My new crewmate later insisted on being a... And here we go, pronunciation again. Now we're into Arabic. My new crewmate later insisted on being a mukanath. I do not know an English word that has the same meaning. When they are born, the midwife says they are boys, but as they grow older, they come to realize that they are women. As you can imagine, there is often some confusion as to their status, but Muhammad said they are women, and I do as the prophet says. And as the British hand on May Leash says, of course, I never forget this. But all of this is not the secret I mentioned before. The girl's sad secret is that her father was the bag of Samarkand. All her family is dead. This would leave her as the heir to the Balik, but only if she were a man. Of course, the girl never claimed to be Mukanath before the fall of Samarkand, and her uncle and the Tura are quietly tearing apart the city trying to find his nephew. I know, to, I know the Hadiths, but I should tell you that this far north, where they are barely Muslim, the status of Mukanathan are a little murkier. I do not think they would count her a woman. I do think... They would consider her exactly the piece they need to consolidate power in Samarkand. Mm -hmm. I must admit I have taken a liking to the girl, but I continue to live in dutiful fear of you and your office, Your Excellency. I don't want you to discover I had rescued a potential heir to the Samarkand bailiff and did not at least offer to hand her over to your tender mercies. Would you like me to deliver her to be fitted with puppet strings? Or should I do the work myself? I can tell her that a British agent saved her from having her throat slit, and she must swallow everything she knows about herself, claim the title of Beg, and rule Samarkand in the interests of a far-off British queen who blackmailed a humble traitor like me into doing her dirty work. 
Perhaps you are better suited to the work. I'll tangle it all up. Or you could let me take her to safety. I try not to ask for much, but I'll make an exception this time. I know you are thinking that you could use her, but she would make you a terrible tool. If you let me keep her, or put her out of harm's way, I promise I will be your loyal, useful cat's paw. I won't even make jokes about your hallowed childhood school. Please advise, holder of my leash. Your favorite puppet, Captain Zandok Shukat. I think that's all good. Uh, we had a, a nice, stunning run-on sentence, but it was... Uh, intentional that time. Ah, the fools. I have retrieved Shlomo's body. They piled corpses in heaps outside the citadel, Russian soldiers and Samarkand cities alike. City, <laughs> Russian soldiers and Samarkand citizens alike for anyone who cared to collect them. A few of the Torah's men stood watch and jeered, or perhaps they were there exclusively to jeer. They called me a traitor's bitch and a whore of the invaders, and somehow they wonder why we welcome the Russians into the city. The funeral will be tomorrow at, and now Hebrew. The funeral will now will be tomorrow at Makhali Yakudian, and then I will retreat to our home. I will observe all the proper customs. Shlomo certainly deserves it. But I will also be seeing every son and daughter of Israel in this city. They will come out of respect for my husband, and also grief and desperation and anger. Justly earned anger from injustices afflicted upon us. I need to sharpen that sentence there. They will come out of respect for my husband, but they will also come out of grief and desperation and anger, because that was not quite there. So now it reads, uh, but I will see. I will also be seeing every son and daughter of Israel in this city. They will come out of respect for my husband, but they will also come out of grief and desperation and anger, justly earned anger from injustices afflicted upon us. I will speak to them about their anger. I will counsel them as to its proper use. I will fan that anger aflame. And I will introduce those with the hottest fires within them to each other, and we will plan. The Torah does not know how feeble his grasp on this city is. The strutting fool does not appreciate how small a fraction of the Russian force opposed his incredible victory. And he discounts the very idea that the city itself can turn against him. We shall show this vainglorious warlord that his bloody... That his bloody belong. That's awesome. I missed a word. Oh, methods? We shall show this vainglorious warlord that his bloody something belong only in Samarkand's past, along with the emirate itself. We shall show we shall show this vainglorious warlord that his bloody tactics, which seems kind of mm, uh, ways. Uh, that needs another adjective attached to it to make the flow work. We shall show this vainglorious warlord that his... Oh, bloody... Goodness. Uh, clumsy bloody ways. We shall show this vainglorious warlord that his dull, dim-witted, brutish, bloody ways. There we go. We shall show this vainglorious warlord that his dim-witted, brutish, bloody ways belong only in Samarkand's past, along with the emirate itself. You might say that this is not a holy use of my Shiva, but this cannot be the first time that mourners plotted revolution in between blessings and prayers. They will pay for my husband's death, and after that is done, 
we will have a peaceful city where our community can bloom. Esther Musarif. Coming to Samarkand. It's not hard to entice a crew of Picaros to visit Samarkand. Not only is it on the way for just about any trip between east and west, the combination of its weak government and heavy trade traffic makes it a smuggler's paradise. Most Picaros of any experience have been through Samarkand a few times. To get specific, though, here are some reasons your Picaros might select Samarkand as their next destination. If they need something hard to get or maybe not usually legal, they can get it at Samarkand. Shlomo Musayev has a solid reputation of imports and exports, or at least he used to before the tour killed him. Maybe his widow can help the Picaros out. The geometric designs that cover the madrasas, I'm sorry, the geometric designs that cover the madrasa facades in the Registan are in fact a coded message from the 17th century. In order to track down an ancient Atlantean site, the Picaros need a map with a level of detail not otherwise available. If the area in question is the Alps, the Carpathians, Southeast Asia, Japan, Java, Celebs, the Philippines, or the American West, well, the man to ask is Ferdinand von Richtofen. There's a price on the head of Abdul Malik Tura. Was it the Russians who put out the hit, or perhaps the Tura's own father, or someone else seeking to blame one of the obvious suspects? An ancient summoning ritual was divided into twelve parts and given to each of the tribes of Israel to be passed down generation to generation as chants and blessings. Much of the ritual, no, blah, blah, blah. much of the ritual has been reassembled, but the Naphtali and Issachar segments are still missing. The German missionary Joseph Wolf insists that the Jews of Bukhara are in fact the long lost descendants of Naphtali and Isaac Shar. Again, I'm probably mainly like that. The Picaros need to get aboard the regular packet airship from Tehran to London. Zandok Shirkat knows exactly how. General Konstantin von Kaufmann of the Imperial Russian Army would like some intelligence on the forces presently occupying Samarkand. What is it he's got that one of the Picaros cares about? The Picaros have come into possession of a dozen crates of top-of-the-line rifles and carbines. No better place to unload such a haul than Samarkand. Its trade network will whisk those crates off to somebody who needs them faster than you can say Silk Road. I think those sound good, so let us proceed to Persons of Note. Abdul Malik Tura, Savior of Samarkand. Literally head and shoulders above most of his peers, Abdul Malik has the shining demeanor of a man unaccustomed to losing. His smile is infectious and his bravo bravado compelling. It also doesn't hurt that he is covered in expensive fabrics expertly tailored to his frame. His signature purple silk turban seems to float above his head, as effortless as the rest of his successes. Jewels wink from the hilt of his scimitar. The only note that might seem off about the man are the heavies and toughs that follow in his wake, far less polished than their employer, and plainly dangerous. The third son of the Bukhaman Emir Muzaffar al-Din bin Nasser Allah, Abdul Malik was never going to see the throne himself. As he developed a reputation as a black sheep, that possibility grew even fainter, until his father sent him to the distant Gusar district to serve as its hakim. It was there, outside the palace and confronted with the very real problems of Bukharan subjects, that Abdul Malik discovered a sense of responsibility for the common people. Without much in the way of resources from the capital, he made allies among the hill tribes and with local mercenaries, and in time became so well regarded the people called him Tura, a mark of respect. When the Russians invaded and seized Samarkand, the Tura immediately sent word to the palace, but was disappointed with the lukewarm response from his father. So he rounded up his allies and marched on the ancient city. A week later, he liberated it and was not just the Tura, but a hero. The warm glow of that victory has not yet faded, 
but it is beginning to occur to Abdul Malik that he has no plan forward from here. Possible wants for the tour. Find Golbeg. That does not have the context it needs. Golbeg, in case you uh, didn't make that connection, that was totally implied and not made explicit, uh, is the girl who is the daughter of the dead Bay. So, we should say, find gold bag. The missing air. To make the sound like I'm Gaelic. Uh, this is this is also my problem. I know that west of here they're called bays and they rule Balix, but I know in Sam in Samarkand and Bukhara that area they're called Begs, but I don't know if that makes what they rule a Beglik or a Balix still. I'm going to go with Balik for lack of knowing better. Okay, other wants for the Tura. Commandeer airships in port to defend against the inevitable Russian return. Root out Russian spies within the city. Secure Gasparelli's endorsement. And marry Fatima Gul Begum. Speaking of Fatima Gul Begum, the missing heir of Samarkand. Slight and retiring, there is nothing that Fatima Gul desires more than to melt into the background and be blessedly ignored. The young woman hides her delicate features behind a curtain of her glossy black hair and wears a beige canvas jumpsuit two sizes too large. She carries a set of mechanics tools with her as if waiting for an excuse to use them instead of make conversation. Very occasionally, though, there is a glint of gold and scarlet at her throat, betraying the presence of a pendant far too fine for the common laborer she pretends to be. Pretending to be someone else and hoping not to be noticed is a common theme in Gull's life, which began in the Samarkand Palace as the Bay's sixth son. While Gull knew from an early age that she was female, she feared the, consequences, the, she feared the consequences of refuting her family's assumption that she was male. She told no one, living in silence, shame, and fear for the better part of two decades. She could not even bring herself to confide in her childhood friend, Abdul Malik. Her only escape was reading about the developing field of aeronautics. She even convinced her father to allow her to crew on a quietly and very well compensated packet airship running mail and cargo to the capital and back. When the Russian invasion seized the Samarkand citadel, Gol managed to escape to the Afrosayeb mooring derricks. Her packet ship was not in port, so she snuck aboard the long-haul cargo ship, the Aftab Gardan. She was discovered in short order and brought before the ship's captain, Zandok Shirkat. To her surprise, though, she was not thrown onto the street, but offered a position on the crew instead. More desperate than suspicious, Gull accepted, giving her name as Fatima. Now she waits to see what will befall her childhood home, and struggles with whether she will return to it. Possible wants. Keep her identity secret. Get out of Bukhara. Gather support for her claim to the Balik. Which, which is not what actually has on the page, so I'm going to correct that. Gather support for... Yeah. Fabricate an alternate heir. And, lastly, a private audience with the Tura. Esther Musaif, Israel... It's not Israel. It's noon. Excuse me. It's Israel with a little apostrophe in Bukharan. Uh, Israel matriarch. It may be easy to overlook Musaif at first, but not for long. Eventually, eyes are drawn to her imposing frame draped in black and the palpable aura of grief and simmering anger that surrounds her. 
Her hair is pinned back and her fate is, is drawn, carving new lines into features not quite old enough to bear them. Her hands pass a small prayer book back and forth, the only trace of anxiety that she portrays. Tracing her inks... Blah, 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 blah. That's good. That's not actually what it says. Tracing her ancestry back to the nigh legendary Rabbi Yosef Maimon, Esther was raised in the prosperous religious household of her father, a pillar of the Israel community in the city of Bukhara. It was no surprise when she married well to the jeweler, banker, and merchant Shlomo Musayev. His business required the couple to split time between Bukhara, Samarland, Samarkand, and Kiva, and Esther immediately set to work quietly building and strengthening networks of family, business, and religious connections in each city. They had four children. When the Russians came to Samarkand, Shlomo met with the invaders to welcome them to the city. He had great hopes for Russian rule, which had elsewhere provided much greater religious and economic freedoms than the casually repressive policies of the Bukharan Empire, Emma, oh man, Emirate, which I've misspelled, and Kievan Khan, and that sentence is way too long. So let's chop it down, shall we? Uh, do 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 do. So let's spell Emirate correctly. Uh, he had great hopes for Russian rule, which had elsewhere provided much greater religious and economic freedom freedoms. Uh, do 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 do. This is a very long and complicated sentence. He had great hopes for Russian rule, period. Oh. They offered much greater religious and economic freedoms than the casually repressive policies of the Bukharan Emirate and Kivan Khan. Shlomo would never see that day, however. He and his delegation of Jews were caught in the citadel during the tour's reconquest, and when the Bey's fa I've got Bey here and not Beg. Beg. He and his delegation of Jews were caught in the citadel during the tourist reconquest, and when the Beg's family... when the Beg's slaughtered family was discovered... They were all executed. Oh, no, no, no. This is not good. Okay, so first of all, they were all executed. They is ambiguous, so we need to sharpen that. But more more importantly, he and his delegation of Jews were caught in the citadel. Uh, I don't want to make the implication that it was just the Jewish community that returned for us, because that's problematic. Um, uh, so we're going to turn Jews into fellow sympathizers. He and his delegation of fellow sympathizers were caught in the citadel during the tour's reconquest. And when the big period, because again, long ass sentence. When the big slaughter family was discovered, however, the entire delegation was, as, was executed. Uh, so now reads. Shlomo would never see that day, however. He and his delegation of fellow sympathizers were caught in the citadel during the Tura's reconquest. When the Beg's slaughtered family was discovered, the entire delegation was executed. Esther buried him and sat Shiva for a week, receiving visitors to share their condolences. The widow dedicated that time to identifying and organizing those among her community willing to take up arms or shabbat shabbatas sabotage the Tura's forces. Now, as the week of mourning closes, she prepares to act. I'm pretty sure I need to capitalize Shiva there. Possible wants. Cripple Samarkand's defenses. Petition Golbeg, wherever he is, to punish the Tura. Reveal Golbegum's secret. Get a message out to the Russian forces, sharing critical weaknesses of the Tura's forces. And lastly, see the Tura dead. Ismail Gasparali, pan-Turkic newspaperman. 
With a spare, wiry build, Gasparelli seems to swim in the ill-fitting three-piece suit he wears in quiet defiance of the billwing local fashion. He keeps his close-cropped hair tucked beneath a red fez, but cultivates an impressively wide mustache. A simple, single-knotted tie cinches at his neck. More often than not, his spring-powered recorder is in his hand, ready to take down statements for his next article, or to record the local dialect on the wax cylinder nestled inside. Born in Crimea and educated in Moscow, Ismail Gasparelli sees the future for his people in the modern world of Europe. The only problem is that his people, the Turks, are a poorly defined ethnic group spanning three continents and with little sense of shared history. Gasparelli has worked as both a teacher and a journalist, and most often both, from Russia to Crimea to Anatolia to Egypt. Everywhere he has gone, he has seen people getting slowly left behind the ever-accelerating world of modern progress. He believes if the Turks can only realize their common cause, they can establish modern schools, simplify their splintered language, and stride forward into the prosperous light of the modern day. I threw a the in there, which isn't on the page, and it should be, so now it is. Hired as a war correspondent, Gasparelli came to Samarkand in the wake of the Russian Imperial Army to cover its glorious victory. Events did not progress as expected, but Gasparelli is not overly concerned. As promising as he finds the prospect of Russian conquest of Turkish lands and subsequent enfranchisement of Turks in the Russian Duomo, his real goal is to see firsthand the furthest edge of the Turkish world. If he is to see his dream of pan-Turkism come to fruition, he must first understand the many variations of his own people. What he has found in Samarkand troubles him, however, and he is finding himself moved to act for his brethren. Possible wants. Recruit the Tura to pan-Turkism. Organize Samarkand citizens to demand democratic reforms. Establish a secular school. Publish a broadsheet revealing the tour's brutal massacre within the citadel. Convince Richtofen to catalog geographic features by their native Turkish names. That one's a little, little obscure and abstract, but sometimes that's the fun one. Okay, let's see next. Baron Ferdinand von Richtofen, grounded geographer. A sizable man with an equally sizable beard, Richtofen managed to come across as prurient, reckless, and wild-eyed all at the same time. Directly... Uh, dressed in slacks, a billowing shirt, and a matching vest, the jacket component of his suit always seems to have been misplaced somewhere. His sleeves and pants legs are cinched at elbows and knees, and over the silk trousers he has strapped a utility belt bristling with various instruments. Atop his receding hairline he sports a heavy pair of goggles. Educated at Breslau and Berlin, Richtofen distinguished himself as a geologist and geographer in the mountains of Europe. In 1859, he recruited. He was recruited. In 1859, he was recruited for the Uhlenberg expedition, a Prussian diplomatic mission to East Asia. Shortly thereafter, he worked in the American West, discovering gold fields. He was there when Atlantis rose from the sea. While many of his colleagues drifted their interests from geology to archaeology, Richtofen stuck with his rocks and mountains. And we need to sharpen that a little bit because the archaeology is the developing field. One of the more interesting bits of doing the research as I start, I tried looking up archaeologists of the period, and there weren't any because archaeology wasn't a field yet. Uh, da -da 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 -da. So now, while many of his colleagues drifted their interests from geology to the exciting new field of archaeology, Richtofen stuck to his rocks and his mountains. Okay. Most early 
archaeologists were geologists by training. The advent of the airship broadened and simplified geographical surveys, and Richtofen leveraged his family's wealth to secure a small survey craft. On his way east to map the roof of the world, though, he fell afoul of the second fall of the Samarkand Citadel. A stray mortar destroyed his starboard engine. To add insult to injury, the local warlord, the Tura, suspect Richtofen may have ties to the Russian invasion, and has forbid the geographer from launching his airship even if he does get it fixed. Possible wants. Repair his ship. Convince Tura... Well, I have Tura Beg, which is the name I was using for him before I understood something better. So, convince the Tura. Convince the Tura to allow him to continue his geographical survey. Obtain false flags from Shirkat to identify his ship as an ally. <laughs> Acquire genealogical records of the Israel community to prove that they are a lost tribe of Israel. Woo Fatima Gull, who he has seen atop a neighboring mooring derrick. Zandok Shirkat, merchant and spy. Tall, broad-shouldered, and trailing a mane of onyx hair behind her, Shirkat cuts a striking figure even when she merely crosses the room. She dresses down, just a flight jumpsuit, with the deliberate care of every movement she yeah, but the deliberate care of every movement she makes often draws inadvertent attention. Most of the time, she can deflect any such attention with her bright smile and forceful personality. When that doesn't work, she wears a concealed holster loaded with a bladed pistol, easily accessible through a slit at her hip. The Shirkat caravan has been working the Silk Road... <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> the Shirkat caravan has been working the Silk Road for all of living memory. Zandok is just the is the newest generation in the family business. As trade has taken to the skies, Zandok and her siblings have followed suit, and the caravan is now a trio of airships that pass each other going opposite directions every six weeks. All would be well if Shirkat's ship, the Aftab Gardan, had not breached a gas cell over the Caspian Sea while smuggling silk into Russia. They were rescued by a British Navy ship, but in the course of the mid-air repairs, her illicit cargo was discovered. The British ship was conducting Sir Ronald Thompson to his new diplomatic post in Persia. I should change that to Iran. He immediately blackmailed Shirkat into acting as his cat's paw. So... While the British call it Persia, uh, because they're going off the Greek, uh, the Iranians have basically always called it Iran. Uh, and we try to use uh, endonyms, if at all possible. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Uh, the British ship was conducting Sir Ronald Thompson to his new diplomatic person, Iran, he immediately blackmailed Shirkat into acting as his cat's paw. Shirkat came to Samarkand in order to gather intelligence on the city and deliver it to the Tura. While in port, a stowaway was discovered in her hold. Taking pity on the runaway, Shirkat offered the girl employment instead of punishment. It was only after Shirkat delivered the intelligence and the Tura took the city that she realized the real identity, identity of her newest crew member, Fatima Gull. She can only speculate the girl's value to Thompson, the Tura, or the quickly destabilizing situation on the ground. But she does know the price Fatima will pay if she does not help her escape. So that's uh, too long of a sentence and should be broken up. She can only speculate as do the girl's value. Uh, she can only speculate as to the girl's value to Thompson, the Tura, or the quickly destabilization on the ground. However, she does know, and this is going to cause, oh no, our flow problem. However, she does know the price Fatima will pay if she does not help her escape. Uh, and we need to 
to make that shakat so it's obvious who we're talking about. However, she does know the price Fatima will play, pay if Shirkat does not help her escape. Oh my, that's a big, big flow problem. Okay, that's interesting. Then we have a style problem as well. That's really bizarre. Stop that. There we go. And which allows us to make this lower. Okay. I can go to the next page. Good. Yay. Flow problem fixed. Uh, yeah, I wish I could show you the flow problems as I do them, but that's a screen share thing I don't know how to do yet. We'll see if this turns out to be anything worthwhile. Okay, so we now have... Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Uh, but I realized the real identity of her newest crew member, Fatima Gull. She could only speculate as to the girl's value to Thompson, the Torah, or the quickly destabilizing situation on the ground. However, she does know the price Fatima will pay if Shirkat does not help her escape. Possible wants. Deliver Fatima to the Torah. Convince Fatima to abandon her own gender. Extract payment from the Torah for her help in the siege, cut her own puppet strings, or identify the ringleader of the Russian sympathizers. Okay, last week we have the names list with ha which have little uh, paragraphs at the top for introduction, which I will read, and then names list, which I won't because I'll just slaughter all of them. Uh, so here we go, some local names. Uzbek names. As with the rest of the Uzbek language and many of their customs, this list shows many influences from neighborhood cultures, neighboring cultures. Samarkand residents would recognize all of these as Uzbek names. Uzbeks typically go by a single personal name, with any necessary clarification provided by supplying their father's name. Farsi names. The ruling class of Bukhara is distantly of Persian origin and gives its children both Farsi and Arabic names. Shirkat's crew are also primarily Persians, although, like any airship, she's collected a few crew members from elsewhere, too. And you'll notice, I've got Persian in there again. So we'll choose Iranian and Iranian. Uh, the ruling class of Bukhara is distantly of Ar Iranian origin and gives its children both Farsi and Arabic names. Shirkat's crew are also primarily Iranians, although like any airship, she's collected a few crew members from elsewhere, too. Farsi does not use surnames, although Farsi speakers might provide the name of their home city or district to clarify. Bulur Samarkandi is Bulur from Samarkand. Nuri Kavchinoni is Nuri from the Kavchinon neighborhood. Doom ba boom. Okay, we shall save our changes and spit out a new version. Uh, but this concludes the reading of the first draft of Samarkand. Uh, this was useful for me. I don't know if recording it and showing it to other people will be useful. Uh, but uh, I got a lot of uh, good catches and edits, and I think it'll be much better for the experience. So, hey! Uh, otherwise, uh, if you watched this whole thing, uh, thanks. Uh, hope you're excited about the thing, uh, and I enjoyed sharing it with you. So, 